Samvega, then, refers to the experience that may be felt in the presence of a work of art when we are struck by it, as a horse may be struck by a whip. It is, however, assumed that, like the good horse, we are more or less trained, and hence that more than a merely physical shock is involved. The blow has a meaning for us, and the realization of that meaning, in which nothing of the physical sensation survives, is still a part of the shock. These two phases of the shock are, indeed, normally felt together as parts of an instant experience, but they can be logically distinguished, and since there is nothing peculiarly artistic in the mere sensibility that all men and animals share, it is with the latter aspect of the shock that we are chiefly concerned. In either phase, the external signs of the experience may be emotional, but while the signs may be alike, the conditions they express are unlike. In the first place, there is really a disturbance. In the second, there is the experience of a peace that cannot be described as an emotion in the sense that fear and love or hate are emotions. It is for this reason that Indian rhetoricians have always hesitated to reckon peace as a flavor in one category with the other flavors. In the deepest experience that can be induced by a work of art, or other reminder, our very being is shaken to its roots. The, quote, tasting of the flavor, unquote, that is no longer any one flavor is, as the Sahitya Darpana puts it, quote, the very twin brother of the tasting of God, unquote. It involves, as the word, quote, unquote, disinterested implies, a self-nodding, a sematipsa liquiscare, and it is for this reason that it can be described as quote-unquote dreadful, even though we could not wish to avoid it. For example, it is of this experience that Eric Gill writes that, quote, at the first impact I was so moved by the Gregorian chant as to be almost frightened. This was something alive. I knew infallibly that God existed and was a living God. Unquote. I have myself been completely dissolved and broken up by the same music, and had the same experience when reading aloud Plato's Phaedo. That cannot have been in quote unquote aesthetic emotion, such as could have been felt in the presence of some insignificant work of art, but represents the shock of conviction that only an intellectual art can deliver the body blow that is delivered by any perfect and therefore convincing statement of truth. On the other hand, realism in religious art is only disgusting and not at all moving, and what is commonly called pathos in art generally makes one laugh. The point is that a liability to be overcome by the truth has nothing to do with sentimentality. It is well known that the mathematician can be overcome in this way when he finds a perfect expression that subsumes innumerable separate observations. But this shock can be felt only if we have learned to recognize truth when we see it. Consider, for example, Plotinus's overwhelming words, quote, Do you mean to say that they have seen God and do not remember him? Ah, no. It is that they see him now and always. Memory is for those who have forgotten, unquote. To feel the full force of this quote-unquote thunderbolt, one must have had at least an inkling of what is involved in the Platonic and Indian doctrine of recollection. In the question, quote, Did he who made the lamb make thee? Unquote, there is an incomparably harder blow than there is in, quote, Only God can make a tree, unquote, which could as well have been said of a flea or a cutworm. With Socrates, quote, we cannot give the name of, quote-unquote, art to anything irrational, unquote. Nor with the Buddhist think of any but significant works of art as, quote, stations where the shock of awe should be felt, unquote.